Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to the uh, St. Louis Chess Club. Uh, it's nice to have you all here. And uh, my name is Sunil Viramantri. I'm going to teach you a little bit about um, some tactics and I have two games that I think you'll find very interesting. You know, the object of the game in the end, of course, is to checkmate the king, right? And it's a lot easier to checkmate a king if you can pull that king closer and closer to your territory, right? So if you can go in and attack him and get him to walk forward, you know, take a walk, see if the sun is shining, you know. And the deeper the king comes up the chessboard, the easier it is going to be to checkmate him, all right? So we are going to look at two games where this happened. Um, and um, the games have a personal connection because the first game is a game that I played uh, and the second game is a game that my stepson uh, Hikaru Nakamura played. So this first game that I'm going to show you was a game I played in 1963. So that was a long, long time ago and uh, I was just starting to get good but I, I was not it wasn't clear what my rating uh, was at the time. I would say that it was about 1,200, all right? Uh, I hadn't played a lot of tournaments. And this was a game I was playing against somebody who was definitely a stronger player than me. And I remember going into this game, I was extremely scared. And, uh, you know, I thought I would lose for sure. And one of the reasons I'm also showing you this game is because uh, I believe this was the turning point in my chess career. Uh, when I won this game, I realized that playing higher rated players wasn't such a scary deal and um, that you had to go in with a positive mindset, right? So whenever you go into play, don't look at somebody's rating, don't freeze because they have a higher rating, right? believe that you have a chance to win. And I'll tell you, and I'll, when I, as I go through the game, I will show you exactly at which point I felt that I was doing all right and where I became more confident. Because as I said, starting off, uh, I wasn't so sure, all right? So I also chose this game because it is an opening that um, that all of you probably start with. I know when I started playing, I learned the classical games first, and that meant starting with e4. And, um, and so that's, I'm going to put this into training so you don't see the moves. And uh, I was white, I played e4, my opponent played e5. And all of you have probably at some point played an Italian game, right? So you will recognize these moves easily enough. Knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5. Right, as you know, this is called the Italian, also, also known as the Gioco Piano. And you know, I had started chess when I was six or seven years old, but I had nobody to show me anything. And uh, I played this position for the first six years that I played chess without ever knowing that this move, c3, was a common move. Because when I played, I used to either, what would be, what would be a move that you would play? Uh, knight? Knight x e5. Ah, be very careful of knight x e5. You don't want to do that because he will take you Right? Aha. Uh -huh. So somebody told you something about a center fork trick, right? And you think you can play knight takes e5. So I have bad news for you. It's not going to work. Yeah. And uh, you're Akshita, right? Yeah. yeah, Akshita, I'm sorry. It's not going to work in this, but I'll show you why, okay? So if white plays knight takes e5, then black will take back with his uh, knight and of course you want to win, try to win the piece back uh, by 
you know, forking the bishop and the knight. There you go. And that's the reason it doesn't work in this position, okay? So, um, so you see that. So let's go back. So what are some normal moves in this position? Uh, let's, um, let's see. It's hard to see here. Um, and that's... Uh, <laughs> so now do I remember names? Uh, Leah. D3 is a common move, yes. All right, nothing wrong with D3. You're moving a center pawn. Remember, when you develop pieces, you always want to move your two center pawns whenever possible. Um, what's another move that you could play, another good move in this position? Um, um, Gabriel. Castles. Castles, yeah, perfectly good. Castles is a very normal move. Um, someone else, give me a different move. Let me back up here. And um, uh, Ditya? Knight c3. Knight c3. I think you've given me all the normal moves in this position. So if you look at the, uh, the table up there, you see that the first one, knight takes e5, we've decided now we are not going to play that, right? But knight d3 is a normal move, castles is a normal move, and those are the two normal moves. And knight c3, which, um, which I just put in here also. But I didn't know that the move c3 was considered the best move in the position. Nobody had ever showed this to me. You know, I thought that this was not a good move because the pawn is taking the knight square, right? So if you play pawn c3, you cannot put your knight on c3. So I, I never knew about this. All right? Okay. But so why? What's the point of putting the, knight on, uh, the pawn on c3? What's the point of doing this? Right? It's hard for me to see. Um, that's uh, Alex, right? Alex? E4. Yeah, so the idea is to build a pawn chain. You all know what pawn chains are, right? So here's a pawn chain starting from B2 to C3. White's plan is to extend that pawn chain by playing D4 and stretching that into the center to try to take control of the center. You see? But I didn't know this move, and I had just been shown this move a little bit <coughs> a little while before this game, so I thought I'll try it. And my opponent, who was maybe about 500 points higher than me, um, he played a very interesting move here. He played queen e7. And now, I was completely on my own because I'd never seen this move before in my life. Right? Um, so whatever I had studied was not going to help me, you know, I had to figure things out for myself. So when your opponent makes a move that is not in, uh, not in keeping with what you have studied, right, what do you think you should do? What should you do when you're, you know, you're in that situation? Amog, wh what should you do? Correct. The important question is why. When they do something that you are not expecting, you've got to ask yourself why. Right? If you can understand why they are doing it, then the chances of finding a good reply are much better. Okay? So I'm going to ask you. You've never seen this position in your life. Right? Your intention was to build a pawn chain going to d4. He played queen e7. Why? What is he trying to do? Oh, to castle queenside. You know, there's a long way to go for that, right? That's not so easy to do. You have to move a bishop out of the way. You know, you got to move, so you have to move the pawn, then you have to move that bishop. I don't think that's really the immediate reason, okay? This has to be something a little, you know, more, uh, a li little more uh, important in a way. Um, 
Yes. Um, by the way, uh, some of you have not answered. So, and I, I know I'm not doing a great job with the names, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Um, so make sure you all answer questions. Otherwise, what I'll do is I'll start calling on you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. So, so Leah said that the reason for queen e7 is after white plays d4, if black takes the pawn, right, then whatever white chooses to do, there's a very good chance the queen can come down and take that e4 pawn with check. Do you see that? Now do you understand why he put the queen there? And so, you know, I thought about this. I said, yeah, that's it. I figured it out, right? That's what he's trying to do. I'm not going to let him do that. All right? So what's a simple way of handling this uh, for me, Saket? Well, you know, I don't... No, 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 no. I'm, I'm white, right? He played queen e7. It's white's turn, right? So you, we need to give a move for white. All right? And uh, that's okay. And uh, next, sitting next to uh, Leah, this is Sanvi, right? Yes. Sanvi, what do you think? Castle. Absolutely. Hey, he wants to take that pawn with check, right? Let's just get the king out of there, you know? Then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Then if he wants to steal that pawn, we may even be able to put a rook on e1 and... Um, and Pin him, right? So, yes, yeah, so that's what I did. I castled. And at this point, he played d6. And now I can go back to the original plan, pawn d4. So does everybody understand right now what's happening? And you see he did something a little bit different. And then you reacted to that, right? And then you were able to go back to the original plan. This is extremely important, right? Opponent does something different. You don't just automatically, blindly play, you know, what you had memorized, you see? You always have to think, the moment he does something different, you think about why he did it, all right? Okay, so now he played this move, pawn takes pawn, which actually is not a really good idea because he loses control of the center you see how white ends up with two pawns on the, um, on the fourth rank, right? And notice those two pawns are side by side. That makes his control of the center very good because it, uh, it attacks all the squares, four squares in front of those pawns, right? The, um, what he should have done is he should have retreated the bishop immediately. At the moment, you can see those two pawns in the center, and black has only one center pawn, and it's only on the third rank. You see this kind of pawn structure an awful lot in games. If you end up with two pawns in the center on the fourth rank, and your opponent has one pawn on the third rank, and those are the only center pawns, the person with the two pawns in the center has a big advantage. So this is a good structure, all right? And uh, it's something you should aim for, all right? Now, what you should have done, and I'll, sh I'll see if I, let me just try to put this in and show you the difference. If instead of taking, he moved this bishop back, notice that black has still got a little bit more control over the center than he had when he took the pawn, right? So if you compare this position to when he takes the pawn, um, you'll see the difference. You see the difference? Right? So the, that first situation was better. He should have retreated the bishop right away. All right. He retreats the bishop now, and I play a good a normal developing move here. Somebody suggest a move for white, please. Uh, Sanvi? Knight c3 is correct. I think that's a very sensible move, right? And now black plays a tricky move. Bishop g4. And bishop g4 is annoying because... Correct. Because by pinning this knight, 
it's undermining the support for the D4 pawn. Right? And that means the D4 pawn is in danger. You see? And, you know, this brings up a really interesting point in chess, which is how do you handle an attack? Now, normally, and our first reaction when we get attacked is to either defend ourselves or to move away. Right? But that's not the only way to handle an attack. You can also handle an attack by counterattacking. You see? And, you know, this game, this position, is a very good example of why I was not yet such a strong player. Because I was worried about the D pawn, and I played a very bad move in this position. It's a move I would never play today. But before I showed you what I play, what I did play in this game, can you tell me what you think might be a good move for white? So let's see if I can call on some people who haven't really answered. As most of you have been doing a really great job answering. Uh, that's Kian, right? Yeah. Go ahead. H3. H3. All right, Kian, I understand what you're trying to do. But H3, he could still take that knight, couldn't he? Oh, yes. And, and then he could take on D4. So H3 isn't really going to work. Isabel? Bishop where? Or Bishop G5. G5. Or Bishop B5, pinning that knight. Yes, that's one solution. You can do that and try to um, take away the pressure on D4. Right? I will accept that as, you know, as a good answer. All right? Um, there are other moves that are very interesting. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Drew. Bishop E3. Bishop E3. Okay, fair enough. So let me show you that line because that's the first move I considered. And then I decided not to do this. So the reason I didn't like bishop e3 as much, Dhruv, is that he can still take on f3, you see. And now if I take with the queen, then the uh, d pawn is not protected well enough, correct? And if I take with the pawn, I do keep the d-pawn protected, but I was a little uncomfortable with opening up that castle position. All right, do you un understand that? And that's the reason I chose not to play bishop e3, okay? But bishop e3 is still a good suggestion. All right, good developing move. Uh, let's call on somebody else. Let's try um, uh, Alan. Knight d5, and, and Alan, what, why did you choose knight d5? Uh, it forced the queen to the bishop, and the bishop can attack the knight. Bravo. And what's your rating, Alan? Uh, okay, well, that move is definitely a higher uh, rating than 1187, all right? <laughs> Excellent. By the way, it's the absolute best move in the position, uh, and that's what I should have done. But of course, I wasn't good enough to play that move, right? Alan stronger than I was at that time. Right, knight d5 is an excellent move. And that's what I mean by a counterattack. Okay? And by the way, if you ever decide to use the counterattack, try to make sure that you're counterattacking something that's more valuable than what is being attacked in the first place. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if he is attacking your rook and you counterattack his pawn, okay, that's not very smart, right? But in this case, the counterattack is on the queen. But Alan explained it very well because what he said was that it has a fork on the queen and the bishop, so when the queen moves, you could take the bishop, you see. And that way, the pressure on d5 has been uh, removed. All right? Uh, 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 Ditya. No, this is... Uh, I'm sorry? Achita. Achita, sorry. Um, can you go to the position before the 
Yes, of course. So back here. So what if they do bishop xf3? Yes. Yes. still have the, oh, okay. So you would still be threatening that, right? Yeah, it gets a little more complicated than that, but I don't want to go into that right now because we have a long way to go. Um, but, um, but I think uh, just queen takes is, is perfectly fine uh, in that position. All right. Also, pawn takes actually is, is possible too because uh, when the queen black moves the queen, you will be able to, uh, to take the bishop off. All right. Yeah, actually. The, Yes. Yes. No, this is true. And so I think the best thing to do in this case would be to take with the pawn so that he doesn't get the tempo when he captures with the knight. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's move on. So as I said, you know, I was not good enough at the time to find the move knight d5. I reacted to the pressure on d4 by pushing the pawn. And this had to be, you know, I'm lucky that I didn't lose the game right now because this is bad for many reasons. Okay, so you get to tell me exactly what is bad about my move, all right? Let's see what you have to say about it. So let's go to... Um, um, Amog. I'm sorry? No, I think that's a little slow. And I think, uh, Amog, if you do that, if your plan is to move the knight and then play c6, you know, I think you will be opening the center uh, and that will favor white. And, and there is a, actually a general point, if I can just make this point for a moment, if you put your hands down so I can see him and then you can go. Um, in general, if you are castled, right, you like the center to open up. If you are not castled and your opponent is castled, you don't want to open the center because that will help him. You see? So the idea of eventually going c6 while you are still uncastled, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Okay? All right. So, um, so what's so bad about my move, uh, Sanvi? Okay, knight can go to d4 and put pressure in the center, but if you're going to move the knight, it's better to go to a center square that's protected rather than a center square that's unprotected. Now you can argue this and you can say, hey, wait a minute, I'll put that knight on d4, and it's still protected by the bishop, right? But there is a better center square if you are trying to move to the center, isn't there? So what is the better center square for that knight if you uh, want to move the knight? Um, uh, I didn't call on you at all. And um, can you remind me again? Sorry. Uh, Anuj and Anushka, right. Ah, and I, you know... <laughs> I missed that. Okay, Anuj. 95 is a whole lot better, and we'll see what happens with that because that's actually what happened in the game. 95 is a lot better, you know, for one very simple reason, right? What is the one very simple reason that 95 is a better square than knight d4? They are both in the center, right? Why is that, Ditya? No, but the other one is also attacking the knight on f3. Look, if I play knight d4, I'm attacking the knight on f3. If I play knight e5, I'm attacking the knight on f3. So why is knight um, e5 uh, a, a stronger move, dear? Because now, if, like, if you did, black did play knight d4, they can't move the bishop on b6. Okay. Although the bishop on b6 is pretty happy, you know, he's probably going to stay there for a long time, right? There's a different reason, I think, why the e5 square is the better square, okay? And, um, um, Akshita. Because, um, both squares are protected, but knight e5 is 
And that makes a huge difference. Bravo. 95 is defended by a pawn. You know, when you stick a knight in the center and you can defend it with a pawn, that's a very stable position. When you're defending it with a piece, you know, in some ways you're right, dear. I mean, you know, that piece is tied down to that protection, right? But if you're defending it with a pawn, that, you know, that's a really good situation. So you want to move that knight, you should move the knight to e5. All right. So you could say that one of the things that's wrong with my move when I push the pawn to d5 is I freed up a really good square for his knight, right? That's one reason. But there are other reasons why, move, why my move is no good. Tell me some other reasons why my move is not good. What else does it do? It, you know, it's not, you should also look at whether it hurts white or not. And there's something it does that may end up hurting white. Okay, um, Anuj. Correct. Look, I mean, when you look at it this way, you'll see how, how bad this move is. In one move, I block up my own bishop and open up his bishop. In one move. All it took was one move. Right? You see? And so that's why I should not play this move. I should definitely have played what Alan suggested, which is knight d5. Okay? Anyway, this is what I did. And he played the move knight e5, of course. Notice that not in addition to the pressure on the knight on f3, there is also an attack on the bishop on c4. The bishop is unprotected, right? And so I think the move is pretty obvious here. You want to save your bishop and you want to give more defense to f3 at the same time. And so Sanvi, what did I play? Uh, bishop b5 check doesn't really answer it because in this case he could play he could play c6 attack the bishop if the pawn takes he could take back and then you'll still end up having to play my move so what is the the better move in this position and um, um, Leah um, not queen e2 because queen e2, you're still in the pin. I understand why you said queen e2, because you want to protect the bishop, right? Okay, so that part of it is good. But I would like to get out of this pin at the same time, you know. Um, so the pin is very dangerous. Um, let's go to uh, Kian again. Bishop e2 is what I played exactly, right? But you can see how my pieces are being pushed back. And in this position, I think black is doing very well. You know, he should simply, he could trade off on f3, make some trades, and then play knight f6, for example, and he would be absolutely fine. And this is the turning point of the game, because you see, my opponent um, got a little greedy. And I think the reason this happened was because he was 500 points higher than me, and he figured he's just going to beat me up. You know, strong players have a habit of thinking that way, that when they're playing a weaker player, you know, they just want to beat him up quickly. You see, and you can't really force things in chess. You have to play the position. And what he should have done, you know, like I said, he could have traded off and played knight f6, but instead he played this move. Queen f6. Now, this does not work. And there is an, uh, uh, an important general principle involved here, which is don't try to attack leaving half your pieces at home. I mean, this guy isn't doing anything, right? The rooks are not doing anything. Um, and so you are trying to attack without completing your development. So the lesson here is, don't attack without completing your development, right? Not unless you have an absolutely clear winning idea. And I realized that there was something wrong with Black's position. And remember I said that I was really scared going into this game? Well, this is the first time that I felt that I was doing okay. 
And I'll tell you what went through my mind. Once I realized that my position was, was all right, I said to myself, you know, thinking, you know, to myself, you know, there's no, re no reason to be scared. And I remember thinking, play the position. Don't play the player. Right? Do you understand what I mean by that, right? Because if you play the player, then you're going to get scared because you know he's a better player. You see? So you don't play the player. You play the position, right? And if the position, you know, if the position is fine, the position is fine. You see? And once I realized that, it gave me a lot more confidence going forward, you know? And then I went on, to, I did go on to win this game, and this game is really what made the difference because after this game, I walked out of this game saying to myself, you know, I know I can beat higher rated players. You see? And, and that's really got me moving, okay? So what I did in this position, very interestingly, right, I played the move, knight takes knight. Now, my opponent had seen that. I mean, he's a strong player. He'd seen that. And what he'd seen was that when I play knight takes knight, it moves the knight and there's a discovered attack opening up to that bishop. Do you see that? So, for example, if black wants to take my knight, if he plays queen takes knight, or even if he plays pawn takes knight, then I will simply play bishop takes bishop and I win a piece. Correct? Right? Uh, of course he saw that. But he was counting on another move. He was counting on doing something different. He figured if he changed, if he switched the move order, then he could come out of it, out of this situation without losing a piece. So what did he play? Alan? Absolutely. He played bishop takes e2 and now he's thinking, okay, white is going to play queen takes bishop. You know, uh, because of course that bishop is attacking the queen and the rook. He's going to play queen takes bishop and then he'll play queen takes knight. And everybody is happy because it's just been a complicated trade, a fair trade, right? Yeah. And that's not what happened. You see, in this position, white has a really powerful move. You know, you can never assume that someone is going to recapture. And that's the mistake he made. He assumed that I was going to recapture on e2. But instead of recapturing, I did something he was not expecting. What did I do? Isabel. Bravo. You know, it's always important to look at checks. You never know when a check can cause trouble. All right? Who said earlier, always look at checks and captures, right? Alan did, right? Absolutely true, Alan, right? You know, look at the check. I played queen a4 check and I knew I was going to win this game now because he has maybe four reasonable or four main ways to get out of this check and they're all bad. So let's take the worst one first, okay? He's got to get out of this check. The worst one, of course, is this. <laughs> well, of course, it's checkmate in one move, right? Thank you very much, game over, right? Okay, so obviously he's not gonna do that. So let's look at bad move number two. Uh, this is probably the second worst move. <laughs> okay, ra raise your hand so I can call on you and uh, give everybody a chance, all right? So let's go to, um, uh, to Dia. Absolutely, knight d7 check for king the king and queen. We don't need to go any further, thank you very much. We're going to win this game. Okay, let's try another way to get out of this check. So we've seen two ways to get out of the check. Uh, the other move we need to look at is c6. But this doesn't work very well either, right? What's going to happen here, Sanvi? Um, D takes C6, obviously. And there are a couple of interesting lines here. I mean, first of all, if he plays, um, 
queen takes knight or even pawn takes knight, then uh, he is in big trouble, right? What's going to happen to him now? Um, Socket. Discovered check, right? And then he's going to have to move his king. And then not only do we take the rook, it turns into a queen at the same time, right? But there's another interesting sideline here. Supposing he plays b takes c6, of course you'd play queen takes c6, right? And you see what that is doing, don't you? There's an attack on, you know, it's a fork between the king and the rook. He has to play king e7. And here's now a very interesting situation. And these are little things that can make a huge difference in a game of chess. You know, obviously, you're looking at taking that rook. But, you know, there may be other things you can do. Maybe you don't have to take that rook. You know, what else can we do, Dita? Queen checkmate. Ah, it's not checkmate. You see, no, but it's a good try. And unfortunately, he will go to f8, you see? And, and then it's very hard. It's the queen would be occupying the square. If you play queen d7, the queen will be occupying the square the knight really wants to get to. So there's something else we should play here. And, uh, and what is that, Kian? Yes, and this is what we call an intermediate move. You know, we may end up taking that rook anyway, but knight d5 check, not only is it an intermediate move, it, what else does it do? It forks the king and queen, right? So he ends up having to uh, play king e6. And now remember I started off by saying we are going to examine some king hunts, right? Where you are trying to force that king to keep advancing up the board. And here's a great opportunity to force that king to come up the board. And this definitely is an intermediate move because you want to take his queen. But you're not going to take his queen right now. You're going to do something else first and then you'll take his queen. So you improve your position a little bit here by playing, uh, let's see, um, that, is, um, that is Sanvi, right? I'm sorry? No, you, you can try. Go ahead. What move are you thinking? Yeah. So you can play queen check, but that's what you should do. And if he takes the knight, which he has to because he has no other choice, now you take his queen. And watch what happens really interesting. Do you see how that king is just sitting in the middle of the board? Now... If you want to force that king to force him deeper into white's territory, right? What you want to do is to get behind him and not let him retreat, get behind him and force him to keep moving up. Right? Now I think this is pretty clear, right? Who can tell me the next move? The next move, Isabel, should be Queen E7, bravo. You see, we ended up not taking his rook because we got his queen, but now you see what's happening to his king. There's only one square. He has to go to d4. Right now, keep attacking him from the back. Force that king to walk up the chessboard. Okay, Leah. Queen xd6 is correct. Okay, now make sure he does not retreat. One of the things he's trying to do is he's trying to sneak back by going to um, b5 and then maybe to a6, right? We want to make sure we cut that escape route. Don't let him sneak back that way. So can you tell me the next move? Um, um, an uh, Anushka, right? No, sorry, no. <laughs> That's Anushka. <laughs> this is Akshita. <laughs> <laughs> How do we stop that king from running back? Bravo. If you understand that the principle is to stop the king retreating, then these moves are easy to find, right? King c6, he's got to come forward. 
And I'll just show you this really funny line. You know, now you can look at that king. You know, I mean, he's not going to survive very long. I can tell you when the king is ahead of all the other pieces, right, he's in serious trouble. But there's a very clever move for white here. He can play this move, a4. Do you know what the plan is? What is the plan behind a4? Uh, let's see. Uh, Amog. Rook a3 check, right? Unusual way of bringing your rook into the game, but rook a3 check does it. In fact, you know, if he, for example, this could happen, rook a3 check, and let's say the king um, goes here, queen c2 check. It's kind of like a ladder mate, isn't it? A ladder made with a lot of pieces on the board. <laughs> right, so he plays king a1, thank you, queen d2 would be checkmate, right? So you can see that all of this, you know, this is, um, you can see how that king was forced to come up the board. So we are back to this queen a4 check, and the one move which we did not consider, his best move as a matter of fact, and that's what he played, was king e7. And, you know, earlier, I think it was um, Ditya who, in a similar position, suggested queen d7 check, right? And was it you? Yeah. And, and, and I remember telling you, no, don't do that because the knight really is looking at that square, you see? And, and so I could have played queen d7 check here, but, and I didn't, but I played a very strong move in this position. And um, so let me see if you can figure it out without any uh, hints or any advice from me. Uh, what do you think? Uh, let me ask uh, Ko. Uh, and what's the point, Ko? Um, queen takes, queen yes, six, yes. Okay. So yes, you are correct. The move is bishop g5. Pinning the queen, of course, he has no choice. He has to accept it, right? Queen takes bishop, and now, as Cole said, queen d7 check. Notice he, the king can no longer go back to f8 because queen takes f7 is checkmate, right? So he has to come forward, and the king hunt has begun. Okay, you can finish it off for me. Give me the next move, please, Gabriel. No, Alex, don't tell him. I was just trying to see if he was on the ball. So remember what we've been talking about, Gabriel. What we want to do is to force that king to keep moving down the board. All right? Or up the board, depending which way you're looking at it. You know? And if a few pieces are going to get lost along the way, you don't really care because once this king is deep in your territory and your queen is still on the chessboard, you're going to be able to checkmate him pretty easily. So what do you say, Gabriel? Correct. Queen takes f7. Very good. Of course you lost the knight, but who cares, right? All we want to do is to force that king to keep marching up the board, right? Okay, next move. Next move, force that king to keep marching up the board. Uh, Kian is correct. Now, he better find the right move because if he does the wrong one, he's going to get checkmated instantly. That's the wrong move. Can you show me checkmate in one move? Checkmate in one move. Akshita. Knight takes e2 checkmate. Bravo. Very good. Knight takes e2 is checkmate. So, of course, he didn't do that. He went the other way like he's supposed to. King d4. Still, knight takes e2 checkmate, right? And king c4. Now I get to see if you understood and processed something I told you. Something I mentioned earlier, which is don't let the king find a way back into his territory. Cut off the retreat lines, right? So, Dia, what would you do? A4. I'm sorry? 
A4 is a very good idea. Very good idea. You know, it's just that because you you correctly identified the retreat uh, square as B5, okay? And so that's a very good suggestion. The problem is that it doesn't help your pieces get into better attacking position. You see this queen here? That queen is now not in a good attacking position, you see? And maybe, you know, it's better to improve its uh, position. So, um, uh, Anushka. Queen to d7. Queen to d7 is correct. Very good. Very good. Queen to d7. And tell me why, Anushka. Yeah, it cuts off b5 as a retreat square, right? Yeah, and just to prove the point, okay, by, uh, did you see also how the queen simply got herself into a much better attacking position by playing queen d7? Because if I back up a move, you see that queen wasn't really participating in the attack, correct? But by playing the move queen d7, you know, now she's threatening to come into the game from the other side. In fact, let's take an example. Let's say he plays the move knight f6. Watch what happens. Queen check. And now the king has virtually no defense. He has two squares. He gets mated both ways. Okay, let's take this. Um, um, let's take king c5. Or King D3, it doesn't matter which one. Let's start with, uh, okay, let's start with King D3. Can somebody figure out a mate here? Fairly simple. Um, let's go to Aniket. Rook D1 is not checkmate, but it is the right move, Aniket. Okay, but it's not checkmate because what's he going to do? Yeah, come, come closer, come closer, right? <laughs> and now you're simply going to play... Um, Simply going to play Gabriel. Rookie one is checkmate, exactly, right? And so you can see that, uh, by the way, who said queen d7? That was Anushka, right? Yeah. yeah, queen d7 is what I played. That's an excellent move. Queen d7 cuts off the retreat squares. And probably his best move, by the way, is to play c6. He tried that. And then I played queen takes b7 and he had enough, so he said he resigns and, and that was it. You know, because obviously you can see the king is sitting out there with uh, no help. The queen is on the wrong side, the black queen is on the wrong side of the board to help his king. Uh, notice also, look at that rook on a8, the rook on h8, and the knight on uh, g8. They haven't even moved. Right? All of White's pieces are pretty active. This king has absolutely no hope of surviving. Uh, yes. Um, so do you understand this game? Right? Do you, do you, do you see the, the lessons? You know, one of the things you should do, at least this is what I tell my students to do when, um, whenever, you know, uh, after they, they have a lesson, is to, to think back and write down for themselves like all the general points you learned from this because it's a good way of remembering right because you are never going to have the same position ever happen to you right so what do you learn from going over a game you learn you know general points that can be applied to other situations you see and so it's important you know to, to draw those lessons from the games you look at is something you might want to do, okay? All right, so let's uh, go to a more complicated game. And, um, and this is the game that, um, that Hikaru played. Uh, let me just get to the critical position because we won't have time to look at the whole thing. Let's. This is about a good situation. Okay, let's talk about the position from here. So first of all, a little background about this game. Uh, it was played in uh, 2007. I thought it was 2008, but I see it was 2007. And it, it was one of Hikaru's first major international tournaments. His opponent uh, is from Poland, 
Mikhail Krasenkov, who uh, was uh, at the time it was played was very close to 2700. He has been over 2700 fide and you can see Hikaru was uh, the lower rated player at the time Hikaru was about 2650. And let's just talk about this position. Hikaru is playing black. So let me actually show this to you from his side. So I'm going to flip the board. And um, Black has just played the move queen b6 attacking the bishop and white played rook b1. Perfectly understandable, very normal move. He's also looking at maybe moving this bishop away with some kind of discovery on the queen. Right? Okay, so Hikaru actually took this into consideration and he completely ignored the discovery and he played pawn takes pawn. And in this position, Krasenkov thought he was actually winning the game because he played the move knight c6. Now let's just stop and look at this position for a moment. You see everything that black is threatening, right? First of all, knight c6 is protected by the bishop on g2. Um, of course, black could play rook takes c6, and we'll see that actually happened in the game. But apart from that, white is threatening to move this bishop somewhere, and probably where we are going to move it to is f6, and there's going to be the discovered attack on the queen, right? So, Hikaru played rook takes c6, and Krasenkov plays bishop takes f6. Now, look at everything that's being attacked in this position. So, as I said, Hikaru is playing black. Notice the queen is under attack, right? The rook is under attack from the bishop. The bishop on e7 is being double attacked by the rook and the bishop. It looks like black is in big trouble with it because white has all these threats. You know, and as I said, you know, uh, Krasenkov really thought he was winning this position when he played bishop takes f6. But Hikaru had anticipated this position and he does something that is absolutely spectacular. Um, I think this game, you know, in the future, when, you know, 100 years from now, it probably be a game that's included in a lot of books because the movie played was most unexpected, right? Look at this move. He sacks his queen. Now, What's the point? The point is simply to, um, you know, to expose the king. Of course, the king could run away, but if he runs away, then among other things, we could simply play rook takes bishop, for instance, like this. And I mean, black is, you know, very much better, right? if not just winning. So naturally, Krasenkov figures, all right, well, let's accept the sacrifice. So he plays king takes queen. Now you just gave up your queen for a pawn, okay? You better have something good. So how do you intend to continue? So, remember, if you make a sacrifice like this, you got to follow up aggressively. And remember what we talked about. We talked about the king hunt, right? We want to pull that king closer to our territory. So now, what's the move that will do that? Let's try um, uh, Amog. Bishop c5 check. Do you all agree with that? Bishop c5 check, pretty good, right? Okay, but well, he has a choice, right? 
he could go to um, F1 or he could go to F3. Now, look carefully and tell me what would happen if the king goes to F1. So in the game he actually played king F3, so we'll come back to that. Let's take a look at what might happen if the king goes to F1. Any suggestions? Okay, how about uh, Isabel? Bravo. C3 is the correct move. Because C3, Isabel, tell me why. Because it's a discovered check, and now you see how those two bishops, you know, are just dominating the king, right? So, you know, he would have to play rook e2, he has no other choice. And now, you know, never rush into things, all right? You know, you see a good move, you know, bishop takes rook is a reasonable move, but you just sacrificed your queen. You want to try to do the most accurate move, you want to try and gain as much material as you possibly can, okay? What is the best move for black in this position, Cole? Unfortunately, that wouldn't work. Okay, and I'm going to show you why. Okay, watch this. So, let's say oh. that you play... Yes, did you see something? Um, what takes... What you just did. So, if, you, if black plays rook takes f6, white will give up the bishop, and then he can probably hide his king on g2. So, for example, if this happens, rook takes, you know, uh, you could probably play king g2. He's still surviving, right? So, let's go back. Rook takes f6. What else? You know, I, uh, he would have to play bishop. Uh, he would have to play bishop uh, f3. But like I said, even he does that, it'll create the g2 square as an escape square for his king. So there is a better move in this position. It's not rook takes f6. Um, Alex? No. I mean, I agree that bishop takes e2 is something that we are looking at and we would really want to do at some point, but not immediately. Um, Sanvi? No. Isabel? No. Something a little bit more attacking, a little bit more of a direct attack, because don't forget, whatever it is, you've sacrificed your queen, you know, you don't have all this time to just fool around. You've got to get that material back. Cool. Uh, there you go. The move is C2. And this move is an absolute killer because the pawn is attacking. It's a fork on the queen and the rook. And of course, he's going to have to take it because otherwise we're going to capture one of these two pieces. The pawn is going to become a queen. And when he takes then you have simply have now you can play bishop takes e2 check because he cannot give back any material. See if you played, remember those of you who suggested bishop takes e2 or rook takes e2 earlier? The problem was that white could sacrifice his queen back, right? One of the big things about being ahead in material is that you can give it back. You see? And so if you give it back and survive, then you're happy. This way, he's not going to be able even to give it back because now the only answer is for white to go king e1. And then I'm sure you can give me the next move, right? The, the next move, um, Abshita. Ooh, I think you can do a little better than bishop uh, f3 maybe. I mean, if you are really looking at a discovery, oh. uh, what would be the stronger discovery, Akshita? Um, bishop, 
bishop d3 would be a stronger discovery, right? <coughs> and then you can see you're going to end up coming out ahead in material, you see? So, going back to f1 didn't work, and, and white decided he'll march his king out. And that's exactly what black wanted, you see? Because he was willing to give up the queen to draw that king out into the open. And now, you've got to keep attacking. So, the next move was pretty obvious because that's with a check. Notice the uh, white king cannot go back at all. He's, so, he, the game actually, the king came, uh, came up to g4. Okay, lots of attacking moves here. Let me show you the next couple and then we'll figure out the checkmate at the end, okay? Um, black played knight e5 check. Of course, white could sacrifice his rook, but if he does, after rook takes. Oh, this is a, a, a good question, actually. Um, and see if you can answer this without my moving the pieces. So, why doesn't white simply play rook takes knight? And on rook takes rook, try to checkmate with rook, e8, rook b8 check. Would that work for him, Isabel? Why not? Because bishop f8 can come back and block the check, and there is no, um, uh, the, the king is still in a mating net, right? But because bishop f8 is there, there is no checkmate. So, what happened in the game? was the king came to g5. Hikaru played rook g6 check. King went to h5. And now, you know, even in the middle of attacks, and you can see that this king is really in trouble. What you, tr what you can do is to take away all his escape squares, and threaten to checkmate him. And you can actually do that because the king uh, is in such a bad position, he's not really going to be able to stop it. Now, we want to play rook h6 check, but if we do that, the king will come to g5, correct? So, can you come up with a move that will take away the escape route, right? Take away the escape route, Leela. Uh, Leah, right, sorry. Oh, rook g4. The problem with rook g4, Leah, is that he'll sacrifice his queen. You see? So he'll give the queen back and he may be able to stay alive. So rook g4, if I play rook g4, uh, let me just go back here. If I play rook g4, you can see he could just play queen takes rook, and now suddenly there isn't enough attacking power left, right? Remember when you are ahead in material, you can always give it back to stay alive. So, so let me see, let's go to this position, yep. So what do you suggest? Let's go to um, uh, Kian. Bishop e7. You know, that's a good move, but what I don't like about that is it blocks the rook's protection of the knight. So he could play rook takes knight, and suddenly this square here becomes open for the king, you see? So don't do that. Okay, let's go to Alan. F6 is the move, right? We play F6. Now we are threatening rook h6 check, and there's very little he can do. Um, he tried the sacrifice, doesn't really help because this is check. And now, once again, what would be the simple way to do this checkmate? What we would love to do is rook h6 check, but we know that if we play rook h6 check, the king has an escape square, correct? What is the escape square uh, that he has, uh, Aniket? 
Oh, no, that's not, uh, the Anikit's over there. Uh, uh, sorry, that was Cole. Let's go to, uh, <laughs> how can I mix up Cole and Anikit, right? Um, so, um, so tell me the escape square. What is escape square? Which is the square we want to control? If we want to do this check, right? And we don't want him running away. What is the escape square to control, DJ? Um, no, what, what is White's escape square? King G4. King G4, right? G4 is the escape square, I agree, right? So now, find a way to block off the escape square, and then we are going to checkmate him just like that. Okay, all right, this time, go. Bishop C8 is correct. That's in fact what was played. I think he resigned in this position because there is no way to stop the checkmate. Uh, the move is simply going to be rook h6. Ah, but wait. Supposing he tries to stop the checkmate by doing this. Okay, now hold on. Don't give him a chance to sacrifice his queen. How do you win this position? Remember to look all over the chessboard. Remember to consider all the pieces, you know, even forgotten ones, you know, pieces that you don't like. You haven't used them in a while. They're feeling left out of the action. You know, come on, bring everything into the game. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, Leah. Bravo. You know, by the way, Leah, that, that's, you've given several good answers today, okay? But, but it's not just that you, you got the answers. It's just I can see from the answers that you gave that you have a pretty good uh, view of the chessboard, you know, because, because your answers, you had to actually consider the board as a whole. And, you know, when you see this move, it looks very obvious. But it's not at all uh, that obvious because it's using a different part of the board. The attack is coming from somewhere where there was no attack earlier, you see? And so that's a hard move to find. So congratulations. Yeah, bishop takes f2 is a killer because there's the only move in reply is, uh, is to go to h3 and then, of course, simply checkmate um, Akshita is rook h6 checkmate, right? Yeah. So what I was trying to show you with this today is uh, the power of the uh, king hunt, right? When you bring, when you force the other person's king to come towards your side of the board, even if you have sacrificed some material, it's not, you know, uh, that uh, much of a problem because the closer he gets to your position, the more attackers you will have, even the pawns can become attackers, you see? And so you saw the king really didn't survive by coming up. But what you also saw today, you saw lots of pins and forks and discoveries, right? And I'll leave you with this, which is that I consider, I think, that the three most powerful attacks in chess are pins, forks, and discovered attacks or discovered checks. And there are a lot more that go along with those, but those are the basics, right? If you get good at identifying pins and forks and discovered checks, right? And you put that together with a few other ideas like a king hunt and like battering rams, things like that, you know, you will find that you will play very much better, okay? Great, thank you very much everybody. We'll stop there for today.